So thank you for that. And also thank you, Felice and Andrew, who uh, we will uh, in this conversation refer to by his uh, real name. Andrew Holleran is a pen name, uh, but his real name is uh, Eric Garber. So if you hear me calling him Eric, it's not because I don't know who I'm talking to, uh, <laughs> which which is, not of course, a possibility. Uh, so I, I am so glad at Michael's uh, introduction because I want to say about myself that your works were, when I w first began reading them, which is relatively soon after they were published or as they were being published, uh, they were a revelation to me and a necessary and uh, unforgettable part of my being a gay man in New York after college. And um, reading your books uh, made me see on the page not only great beauty and great literature, but uh, something about the world I wanted to live in and came to live in. And uh, it was a long way from, from Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn to the pages of your books, but I'm very grateful uh, for, for helping me along the way. And here we are all these years later. Uh, so I want to begin, actually, well, first I should say happy birthday uh, to both of you. Uh, uh, Felice's birthday was last Thursday, uh, the 22nd, George Washington's birthday uh, also. And uh, Eric, your birthday, you said, is 9-12. So uh, September 12th, we have a little more than six months. Maybe we'll uh, reconvene uh, on uh, around your birthday, too, if we don't get through everything today. Uh, so I wanted to say that uh, uh, was in the invitation a little bit, the, the research that I did for this conversation and that we're going to show a lot of images of uh, is one, Felice's diaries, which are uh, very detailed, and then also uh, some of Andrew Eric's letters to Felice and to other people like Robert Farrow, uh, who was uh, a friend of yours and uh, a gay writer who unfortunately died of AIDS, as did his lover, uh, Michael Grumley, in 1988. So uh, without further ado, continuing from this theme of what uh, what for queer men in particular, but queer people, your books were able to do, I want, I'm going to share my screen. And that, of course, is the only uh, technically difficult thing I'm going to do during this talk. But here we go. I want to show you, uh, this is Felice's diary. Oh, yeah from 1975, um, and it's June 8th. It's what? It's readable. It's very readable. You have a very neat handwriting, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, Eric, you typed most of your letters, so uh, that is also very wonderful for a researcher. I can't tell you how much time one often spends deciphering uh, handwriting. So Felice, thank you. But on June 8th, 1975, and I'd like to take you both back to your goals as writers and who you were in 1975. I am playing with the idea of writing a book about the gay scene as I am now living it. This includes dancing at Flamingo in the city, going to dinner parties, coming out to the pines on weekends, and in general, carrying on. <laughs> what the purpose of this book is to be is not yet clear to me, however. What its form and format will be is also not apparent. It may be a series of journals or even a journal of one day in the life of someone, a conceit which has done been done before. So here you are, uh, Felice, in 1975, envisioning a novel that is yet to be written, obviously, and uh, Andrew, Eric, excuse me, uh, in 1975, you probably were working on the book that became Dancer from the Dance, published in 1978. So can you talk about 1975 and why it became necessary for the two of you to think about writing a book about the gay scene as you were now living it? Well, I can bring something up, which is that um, I had been going to Fire Island with other people and visiting other people there, uh, Sam Haddad, usually, uh, for 10 or, 10 or 11 years. But in 1975, suddenly an entire group of gay men, professionals together, 
nice looking and who I saw in the city and partied with and who are now out of our and sharing houses. In years to come, I would call them the generation of 75 or the class of 75. So I guess that was for me, the moment that it solidified or crystallized into something. And Eric, you, Eric? Eric, do you remember how Dancer from the Dance uh, began to come uh, together in your mind and when that was? You know, I don't remember when, that's the problem. But when I hear 1975, I think that that's one year away from the tall ships. Wasn't that 76 when yes. we had the mm -hmm. big celebration? Yes. And anyway, um, I was down uh, in Florida visiting my parents in 76 or 7, I don't know when. And um, I had been trying to get a novel published since leaving the uh, workshop in Iowa City for almost 10 years ago, and I was really discouraged. And I told myself, you can try one more and then you have to quit and go to law school. This is just not working out. And at the time I was corresponding, talk about letters, with a friend named John Gallagher, who we would write such long letters in those days. John Preston's letters were like 12 pages sometimes. They were unbelievable. John was a long letter writer too. And he wrote in hand on yellow legal pad paper mostly. And he was very full of camp and gay vernacular in his letters. A lot of underlinings and many exclamation points and a lot of expressions that you only heard in the gay world. And I thought to myself, why don't you just write a book in this style, this voice? And that's all that, that, opened, that I needed to have the book open up for me. And the rest was rather easy. I don't remember how long it took or anything else, but I remember that when I got back to New York, I walked into the West Side Y uh, to exercise and Larry Kramer uh, came up to me and said, I hear you've written a book and why don't you show it to my agent? It was the kindest thing you could have done because I had no idea how to market it. And, and that's the other thing that happened. And so, so it was just accidental and I can't compare it to anything else. And so that must have been his agent also. Pat Loud, was Pat Loud what? Larry's agent? He he, uh, Ron Bernstein was his agent, but I believe. Yeah. Oh, with, I see. Okay. With Pat Loud. And Pat worked for him. Yeah. So Pat Loud. That's read exactly right. I knew her from the fringes of the Warhol crowd. <laughs> yes, Pat Loud was the the woman on on the TV show uh, An American Family uh, right. on PBS. So it must have moved very quickly, Eric, that your book was. Uh, written relatively quickly and then published relatively quickly because it was published in September of 1978 and you're talking about the summer of 1976. So that's quite uh, productive and fast. It was quick. It was quick. And now years later, it's grown to ex be exceedingly <laughs> slow. But anyway, yeah, the first one was easy, yeah. Uh, if, there's a letter that you wrote to Robert Farrow in 1970. I'm not sure if I if I uh, photographed it for this session, but in which you say something in, in very early on in your career that your novel is going so slowly it's being published in the New York Times obituaries section. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I did this, I agreed to do this, was I was so curious as to what you would find. And the thing that I'm most curious about are the letters. And you, I want to just put in here quickly that Robert Farrell wrote the most beautiful letters where they would go, they were living in Italy a lot at the time. And he, he had beautiful stationery and beautiful handwriting and they were just exquisite little objects. Go ahead. Well, so um, we will then, now that we've set up the publication of Dancer from the Dance, I'm going to show uh, the... Um, uh, Felice's account of meeting you uh, on Fire Island on nine six. Ladies' house. <laughs> he yes, I don't know quite what that means, so I you have to explain it. Last night at the crazy ladies' house, where I last attended a dawn pool party come orgy two years back, I went to um, a largish, rather 
disorganized dinner party, at which, however, I had the good fortune to meet Eric Garber. Garber, under the name Andrew Holleran, is the author of the stunning first novel, Dancer from the Dance, which may be the first crossover commercial bestseller. Published by Morrow, it's already in another printing, up to 25,000 copies, and Bantam bought the paperback rights for $175,000. Sorry to reveal your finances of uh, 40 45 years ago, uh, Eric. Excellent (laughs) auguries for the future of an excellent book. Garber, it seemed, also wanted to meet me, thus the arranged meeting by our host. We We were together most of the evening with great pleasure and promised to see each other back in Manhattan. Eric is tall, not slender, not heavy, with the awkwardness of an oversized adolescent. He must be at least my age. Now we know that you actually are the same age or younger. six months younger, though he seems much younger, fresh, naive, innocent in many ways, sharp too, perceptive, curious to find out from me whom he knows about either through hearsay or whatever, what he ought to do next about his success. So do you, who are the crazy ladies and do either of you... Uh, does that provoke memories of that night in 1978 for both of you? I remember the crazy right. ladies' house. It was Fire Island Pines. We had names for all the houses. Uh, the seven most unattractive guys there had a house called Seven Beauties. There was <laughs> the pool. You know, uh, there were <laughs> there was the Kodak Pavilion, which was across from me. Um, my house became known uh, because my two roommates were so attractive, became known as Felice and the Supremes. You know, <laughs> the, the crazy ladies were these four guys. I think mo- I think they were Italian Americans from Long Island, hairdressers and some other stuff. And they just had the best parties. They would go up and introduce themselves to everybody and say, come to our house. We're having an orgy. <laughs> <laughs> And that's who they were. I they don't know sound how like there. <laughs> I don't know how Eric got there. I know yeah. how I did. How did you get to Fire Island that summer, or had you already been going? Well, you must have already been going because yeah, you... I was already going. Oh. What about you, Eric? When was your first time I... on Fire Island, Eric? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I do remember one thing though. Though there, it was the it was the I remember crossing over and reading the New York Times, and there was always. It seemed to me every day there was a little ad for the mesmerist, I think, which was Felice's novel. That's and I thought, my God, how does this guy get an ad every day in the Times? It was so so amazing to me. What Felice talk about that? Yes, tell us. Yeah, about the marketing uh, of the mesmerist. Yeah, that was because the year before, um, eyes had come out in paperback, and it was. Uh, a New York Times bestseller in paperback. So I so I guess they had the money to promote the new book, which also did pretty well. So pretty well, yeah. And so was that was... So, yeah, so Felice was already a, a, a commercially successful writer and I was fascinated by all of that. Oh yeah, that's probably right, yeah. Yeah, um, right at that June was um, a couple of months after my first book was published um smart as the devil which um to my astonishment was uh, a finalist for the first hemingway award uh, i don't know who figured that one out but <laughs> there it was there it was maybe yeah. it was a reader at that uh party come orgy uh you know, maybe right no that was for you. You had a good time <laughs> one could only hope <laughs> I love. I mean, the what what you said about the crazy ladies sounds like uh, Sutherland, you know, saying something like, uh, you know, we're having a, a small crucifixion on, you know, Park and Eighty Third or whatever the <laughs> he, he gives, you know, sort of whispering <laughs> in the darkness. Um, Elise, what were you working on as uh, Dancer from the Dance was published? Do you remember? I mean, I know you had a novel published in nineteen. So that was in seventy. That was in the fall of seventy seven, right? 78. Okay, so, so I had 78. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I was working on the lure at that point. Um, and um, I had come back to New York after being in Hollywood 
I've been working in Hollywood for um, uh, Cary Grant and his wife's company, Diane Cannon, for their wife, Brute Productions. They had optioned the, the eyes for a film, and I had gone out there to work on a film script for them. But I had to go, come back to New York to finish my um, research into the bar scene after hours. So I threw myself into that for the sake of my book. <laughs> <laughs> the self-sacrifice. So you so you left Cary Grant in Hollywood and you immersed yourself in the uh, in the gay life of, of New York City. I mean, right. which was more satisfying uh, talking to Cary Grant or uh, doing the research in the bars and dance dance clubs? I had about uh, 10 years of the most psychotic external life. <laughs> I would go from one to the other, and um, and I enjoyed both of them. They were just you know equally fun, but very very different. There were also orgies in Hollywood. <laughs> they had more actors at them, but you know, was that more... like at George Cooker's house? I mean, was that the kind of party? It no, was? I was too young for George Cooker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was much too young for him, but other people, you know, you know, recording industry people, actually. And then um, the guy who became my, my partner, my hubby, husband for a while, Bob Lowe, he was working for West End Records, and he was out there also for a period of time. And that was Mel Sharon's company. Right, right. So I saw him a lot there. Only he was, he never went to any of the orgies. <laughs> So we're we're going to come to the lure uh, a little later uh, as your friendship with Eric uh, sort of uh, deepens. And what I want to show next is um, uh, your account in uh, your diary um, of the party for Dancer from the Dance when it was public, oh. um, okay. which was on, I guess, September 13th, 1978. Uh, your diaries are extremely valuable in dating things and also in uh, helping to describe things. Last that was the day after your birthday, Eric. <laughs> oh, yes. It was How right wonderful. on your birthday. So How wonderful. you would have been I 30. Didn't realize yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the party was, I guess, a birthday party as well as uh, uh, a book party. Uh, How so wonderful. The party would have been 9-13 the day after your 40, 34th birthday. Uh, last night, I went to a literary party invited by the guest himself, guest of honor, I guess, Eric Garber, also known as Andrew Holleran, author of The Marvelous, Dancer from the Dance. I mean, aren't you relieved, um, Eric, to see this praise in real time as opposed to, my God, I hated this book and, you know, that Felice has been lying to you all these years? He He's actually been telling <laughs> the truth. We know. Um, <laughs> it is a little scary. We've been ruthlessly you. honest with each other right. over that all, the, all these decades. Um, so, so the revelations will not be about his his real feelings about the novel. Uh, yeah. Everyone was there. Faggots I'd seen around for years, publishing people I'd never met and never hoped to meet. <laughs> um, writers such as. Uh, Celebrities such as Pat Loud, Eric's agent, Taylor Mead, Fran Lebowitz, friends, authors such as Marty Duberman, Barry Kaplan, George Whitmore, Mike Emery, Larry Kramer, and others. Ron Bernstein, who was uh, your agent uh, or Larry's agent, Bob Wyatt, and Susan Moldau of Avon Books. All in all, it was a very cocktail party. Um, I'm not sure if that was uh, a, a word missing or just a wonderful phrase, a very common no. <laughs> party. Uh, but do you remember, how did you get Fran Lebowitz to come uh, to your party? And uh, did you know her? And uh, tell us who Barry Kaplan and some of these other people were. Barry, you'd gone to the University of Iowa with, right? Yes, yes. Barry Kaplan was a friend who lived two blocks from me in the East Village. And one day I was in the drugstore uh, standing in line for checkout. And um, I knew he, he was living there and that uh, he had been working as a writer since leaving the workshop. And it was a discouraging day at writing. And I, I just looked at Barry and I said, oh, Barry, I said, this can't go on. And he turned to me and he said, no, he said, the trouble is it can. <laughs> so Barry ditched things, I think, and went to work for advertising 
But that's what it was like. Um, it was very discouraging and hard to get published. Uh, anyway, so I have no idea who did that uh, guest list. And I don't, I'm amazed to hear the list of people who were there. But the thing I do remember and I must honor now is that it was given by a friend named Martin Merle who lived in an apartment uh, building at uh, 6th Avenue and uh, 9th Street. And he put the whole thing together and the whole thing was just magic. And and uh, it's nice to get a list of the people from Felix's diary. Well, that's just some of them. The it was, was much more crowded than that. Have, yeah. have you stayed in touch with Brian have you stayed in touch with Fran Lebowitz? <laughs> I no, you know, I, I, I have an awful story about Fran in, in this regard, and I shouldn't tell it. Please, yeah, of course you fun must. Though. You must, of course. And, and, it could, and it could be totally apocryphal. And I find Fran Lebowitz, I don't know her at all, and uh, I, she's a wonderful writer, though. My favorite thing from Fran Lebowitz is she, her fantasy was that she would leave the, her apartment in the morning, and when she came back, the novel would be written. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. Um, someone told me, I think Martin Merle, the host of the whose apartment it was, said that she came in with some people. She looked at the room. She turned to her companion and said, it's all fags. And they left. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I think it's funny enough that it doesn't bother me in, in, at all. That's really what it was like in those days. You know, there was, it was a very... Um, I remember going to another party that Larry Ashmead, a wonderful editor, gave yeah. yes. on the roof of his apartment building. And so many people in publishing came up to me and said, you know, this couldn't have happened 10 years ago or five years ago. Uh, it was the question of gay material being used in fiction or in literature. And, um, and I was just beginning to sense then um, that it was uh, some kind of change in the publishing industry. Because until then, well, look, Felice's career is a perfect example. Felice had a very successful commercial career, and then he took a chance, really, although the lure was such a clever combination of the two, really, both a solidly suspenseful whodunit novel and gay literature at the same time. But then you took a, a another step forward when you did um, a house by the uh, by the bay uh, by the ocean, etc. Yeah, you were exp no no. You're it was that late it in the late season. In the season was that yeah, one? late in the season. So you you were taking a step in a certain direction. Yes, and all of that was when you're young, you don't know what you're doing. It's only afterwards you 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 learn that people who were there before you that it was unusual to have. It's interesting because Dale which published both of them, Del Delacorte and then Dell. Um, the first one, it was, you know, a bestseller, it had bestseller written all over it, if it was accepted. The second one was not. And, you know, it's been in print ever since, just the way the lure is. And its sales are about fourth or fifth of all of my books. And that includes The Joy of Gay Sex. So I was right to push that too, you know. There are certain people like David Bergman who says, oh, this is the best book you've written, you know. Um, but it was important that um, I, I do a literary book following um, a commercial one. Well, so you didn't think you were, you didn't think you were committing career suicide by writing Game of Matter. You thought you were doing something shrewd in terms of the market too. The first time, yeah. The second time I didn't care. <laughs> so so when you say you know you didn't care was that because what you had uh done what you had outlined in 1975 was coming to fruition and so it was less important to you to make a statement to yourself and to others about it or was that it just became uh sort of natural and the pu and the publishing world and literary world and book buying well, no, it didn't come natural. And like I said, I didn't get a great deal of support from Delacourt and Dell on that book. I mean, they did a nice package and it was a, a beautiful book and everything, but I certainly did not expect, you know, big printings or anything like that. So the fact that it had legs and that it continued over the years uh, was due to partly is due to women who liked the book very much. So, you know, it crossed over in a way that the lure didn't, you know? So 
you know, one crossed over to a, a commercial audience and the other one crossed over to a women's literary audience. That's very I, interesting that you mention uh, uh, women as uh, a- accepting of it because, of course, Pat Loud uh, was Andrew's, uh, Eric's agent. Uh, I believe, Eric, that your book was acquired by a woman, Pat Golbitz, um, at Morrow uh, in 1977, 1978. And then uh, Susan Moldau, an editor who was a friend of yours, Felice, and also uh here we're talking about uh, other other women who were they were they Linda Gray and Linda Gray. Jane and Jane Berkey very important in my in the lure, um, but at one point they said you've had a wonderful commercial career, but if this book fails, you may have to write under a pseudonym. And they were talking about the lure, so and, I mean they were behind it a hundred percent. What, and your agent also, I believe at the time, was a woman named Jane Rotrosen. Um, is, it, is it true that women um, in publishing were more uh, accepting, open to this? I mean, is that something that hasn't, that it wasn't just you know, male editors like Bob Wyatt or Michael Denany, who then became an important editor, uh, first at Macmillan and then at St. Martin's. Uh, did women help gay men uh, and perhaps uh, lesbian to, lesbians too, break through uh, to being published in a way that has not been quite remarked on, I think. Yeah, but you know, you have to remember that women were breaking into publishing at this time, period. It had been an all male, old school feel. Um, and uh, they really, this was how they made their way in, was picking up things that, uh, straight male editors not necessarily would go near and doing uh, new and unusual stuff. And I remember um, when uh, they picked up when, you know, there were other books that came in and other writers that came in and women editor, Stephen King, I believe, had a women editor to begin with also, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was very important for women to establish their territory, as it were, and they did a great job of it. Um, so uh, moving along in your friendship, another uh, wonderful uh, uh, letter, and I just, a diary entry, excuse me, is um, this. I got to go back and read these someday. I know. Well, I mean, you, you have to get <laughs> to New Haven. Um, I just love this. Afterwards, you went you went to a party with Eric and also uh, sat in Central Park and watched a fireworks display. This is uh, later in 1978. Uh, afterwards, we had coffee in Burger King. I just I love the idea that you're on the Upper West Side and you had coffee at Burger King. I mean, this was, of course, uh, in an era before ubiquitous coffee shops um, and talked um, a bit more. He was reticent also about his next project and a bit upset by the by the slump. oh sorry the slump Shrimp. his book has hit in recent weeks i mean uh he's sort of de- uh despairing as to whether it will break away from the gay audience eric is a curious um uh c- combination of innocent and shrewd common sense excited thrilled as he is by his success he yet has both feet on the ground and sees exactly how much things can get out of hand he's a nice man i hope we will become friends i'm so glad we did and oh, this so- is so touching <laughs> so from you know, this, uh, is, this is like there's the reading of the will this is the reading of the diary it's just <laughs> Anyway, you know, but can I go back to what you were saying? That's a wonderful comment about the, the industry. It is true about women. Um, they've always been the driving force really behind publish, uh, books at least, uh, reading books. Henry James used to write his novels for a circulating library, I remember, that was very popular with young women. Anyway, my editor's name was Pat Golbitz, and she took Dancer because she... I gathered and talking to her, it was, to her, it was a romance novel. And beautiful. So I thought that's so incredibly, what, what's the word for it? Not broad minded. I want to say that she didn't find it. 
Thank impossible you. because it was about men. She accepted yeah. it as a as a as a novel of romance. Anyway, I had to put that in. Well, no, so she was willing to read it for its theme rather than its protagonist. Fact, yeah, Sim exactly. I mean, you know, yeah. as, as if its protagonists limited her interest, which it, they did not. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I'm as we move, you know, we have have a few more minutes before we actually take questions from the audience. Quite a bit of time, but I want to. Okay. So, Bill, I wanted to say one more thing. Oh, you know please. that that diary entry from 1975, mm -hmm. the lure wasn't that book and neither was late in the season. That book turned out to be like people in history. Oh, so published much later. I mean, so 20, 20 years later. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I was already thinking about it then, you know, something that would be, and years later, um, people have come up to me and said, oh my God, that's the, uh, the book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that they had said about Dancer years before. But Judy Grant said the nicest thing about it. She said, you write the way gay people talk to each other. Huh. Oh, that's and what? That's, and that I thought was a, the biggest compliment. High praise. <clears throat> High praise, yeah. That's fabulous. That's very beautiful. I know, uh, I know. I was really that, moved by that, yeah. That's really quite wonderful. Um, so... Uh, I, there's there was a question from uh, the audience that I just saw uh, asking about uh, the formation of the Violet Quill, and we're going to get there. Uh, but what I want to show now is uh, what I think uh, from doing research about Larry Kramer, and then also obviously reading in your papers, Felice, and seeing uh, some of your letters, Eric, was this very unusual night um, later in 19. 78, um, when a group of writers are invited by a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker named Helen Whitney, uh, to uh, see a program that she has made, but then also discussing the next documentary that she would like to make. And, and to me, it's really quite uh, beautiful. Um, in the evening, I had a second cup, I'm not quite sure, a second up, oh, maybe you took, oh, maybe you yeah. took a, 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 an amphetamine. Um, but uh, I think the statute of limitations has expired, so you can perhaps admit it. But uh, in the evening, I had a second up, a meeting of gay men and women gathered by Eric Garber, who I'm, whom I increasingly like, to see a screening of Helen Whitney's film, Youth Terrorism, The View from Behind the Gun, an excellent film at times um, bracing and always real, but it answered no questions about what she would do for ABC TV news documentary in an hour on gays and gay life. So after the film, we had our inten an intense meeting of encounter, uh, intelligent, wide-ranging, humorous, um, down-to-earth, uh, sat, uh, I'm not quite active. sure, active, active and real. Among mm -hmm. those present were Eric Gar Garber, Robert Farrow and his lover, Michael Grumley, Larry Kramer, Barry Kaplan, myself, the authors, Michael Denany, Mike Denany, his friend, John, also an editor, and Joan, who teaches at Rutgers. Also an educator was, was Eric's pal, Donald Sullivan. Jay Henry and Robert Naples from Design, Eddie Rosenberg from Sociability. Later on, more of us had some dinner, some of us had, oh, nine of us, excuse me, had dinner uptown from the ABC uh, screening room with Helen and her assistant, uh, Lori. Mm -hmm. It was stated between Robert and Michael, both serious, intense, sexy, intelligent, humorous men, in their mid thirties, I fell instantly in love with both of them. Of course, both of them are later in the Violet Quill, as well as with Helen Whitney. The result in terms of film, I can't say, except that Helen's fine taste of first taste of the gay community through the guys who are of, of a high caliber enough to uh, sustain her enough enough through the fear, suspicion, and shit that will later she will later encounter doing <laughs> so so can you talk about that that night? And also that's why it seems to me, I mean I wanted to bring up this in connection with 
the, the people who are also beyond the violet quill, which forms a year or so later. And as, as I think many people know, was a, a brief uh, short-lived group, I mean, intense, but, you know, six meetings, I think. And, um, but what those six writers were doing and what universe they came from and what you as a community, uh, how you were forming and what you were hoping to do. Can you, do you remember the Helen Whitney? Yeah, Not I remember the whole thing. Yeah. And I remember that Robert um, uh, Farrow was very critical of her um, and he said, well, you know, why are you doing this film on gays? We can understand this other film. Why are you doing this film on gays? And uh, of what importance is it to you to make this film rather than some gay guy, you know? And, um, you know, so he really put her on the spot, if I remember correctly. And then, you know, other people joined in on that, too. But she was very poised and she presented her ideas I thought in a, a pretty good way. I don't know if I ever saw the final film that she did. Did you, Eric? Did you ever see the final film? I couldn't remember it either. All I remember is that we dressed her up as a man one night to sneak her into the eagle's nest. Oh my gosh. I mean, was, was that crazy or what? But there well, are she wanted times to look, yeah. Yeah, she wanted to see right. yeah, for herself, yeah, yeah. Well, um, but she's still around, you know. Oh, she is. She's still making movies. Okay, go ahead. No, no, yeah, I mean that's, she's, that's wonderful. She's a wonderful person. Um, you stayed so, in touch with her. Yes, well, I. Ro Robert was just Robert was being kind of territorial, I guess, in, in <laughs> asking her that. And you know, it's a feeling that was another weird thing before everything relaxed. I remember when Alice Hoffman's novel about a young girl with HIV came out and I thought, how dare she write this? You know, I guess it was an expropriation issue that what we've what we've come to call cultural appropriation. And at the time I thought, no, only a gay person should be able to write that. Well we've dropped that idea. Well that yes, that book was called At Risk. I got I know I wish, yeah. I remember it got a lot of attention Good for you for that yeah. very purpose. Yep, I like that. How did you know that? Well, um, I mean, I, I don't know if I actually read it, but I, I worked at Publishers Weekly when it was published. And, and so wow, I knew okay, as a bit okay. of news that, you know, Alice Hoffman was publishing a book about AIDS. I think it was published in about 1988. So it was hardly, I mean, it may have been groundbreaking as, you know, a writer like Alice Hoffman taking on the subject, but it was not uh, early in the AIDS epidemic or yeah. in that way, any kind of, uh, I mean, this is uh, a year after uh, the founding of ACT UP and, you know, three years after uh, Rock Hudson died, three years after the normal heart. So uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things happening before Alice Hoffman is able uh, to do that or does say it. Um, but also uh, in relation to trying to get a little bit for that, for that questioner about the the Violet Quill. I just want to say that rather than anything that seems to have shaped your individual works, um, it it really did uh, was based on friendship and um, extended friendships. And this is uh, a, about a year before um, uh, this. Um, I thought we would see this uh, description, Felice, again about. Um, uh, I came into the city, this is June 1979, for two reasons. One, to have a dinner party with Edmund White and his friend Chris Cox, who was also a member of the Violet Quill, who uh, died of AIDS in the early 90s, an editor um, at Ballantyne at one point, and with Eric Garber. It turned out to be a charming, delicious, delightful evening. Couldn't be better. One of my great highs of recent months is not only my friendship with these two men, but that I've gained their respect for my work. Eric gave me a terrific uh, quote for the lure. Um, so, you know, once again, I mean, the, the, the past, the diaries, the letters reveals actual enthusiasm rather than feigned enthusiasm. Edmund is looking forward to reviewing the book when it's published. Personally, they are similar men highly intelligent, sort of quirky, very strongly enthusiastic or down, warm, modest, down to earth and real. They are also two of the best writers I've read and it is a privilege to know them. 
So I want to say something about what Philip Clark just asked one of in the questions, the mm -hmm. Q&A. He asked, what kind of restrictions our editors had for me? I had no restrictions whatsoever. None in the lure, none in the lure and none in uh, late in the season. And I don't think I was, I think I was such a monster writer that, <laughs> that they were afraid to restrict right. me in any way, I think. Um, so uh, I want to get to another question that I see. Um, it's about Dancer uh, from the Dance, Eric. One thing that uh, it's William O'Connor asking, one thing that always struck me in Dancer from the Dance was at the end when they see everybody marching in Central Park and realize there were tons of men in that city who weren't on the circuit. And I'm curious why you included something that in a wonderful way pulled the rug out from this idea that everything you'd just read in the book was the whole gay scene. And then did both of you ever struggle with the idea that the gay scene didn't encompass the full spectrum? Please, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can say something about that, um, uh, which is when I moved out to California and I was hanging around with people in Montecito, somebody started talking to me and he said, well, that's because you were a gay list, an A-list gay. Hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I didn't know any any different. He said, well, you went to these clubs and you were you know, a member of the, the Studio 54 and these clubs and this thing, and you went out to bar and whatever. And I said, well, you know, when we first started in the 70s, it was a very small gay scene. It wasn't that big. Mm -hmm. There were very few people who were really out. And there were a lot of people, very few people who were even half out, you know. So, uh, <laughs> that, right? So that moment, I thought, was very truthful, is at that parade, we actually saw, you know, how many people there were. Although I was at the first parade after Stonewall, and there were 600 of us, maybe. At tops mm -hmm. strung out along Fifth Avenue. There were more people on the sides uh, watching us than there were in that parade. So there was a very that would not have been a a, a good indication of how many gays there were in New York. You know, there's there's a, a a very moving thing to me in a very important moment in Larry Kramer's diary, uh, which is also at the Beinecke, um, from 1970. He's been living in London and he moves back to New York uh, in November of 1970 after having lived in London for a decade and after uh, Women in Love is released. And he writes that he's moving back to New York to finally settle down and be gay to lead an open life as a gay man, and it ain't easy to do. And that's November 1970. And uh, you know, he he really never, I mean, whatever uh, uh, issues people do or don't have with Larry Kramer's style or his achievements, uh, his literary or otherwise, um, he remained committed to that for the rest of his life. He never was in the closet in any way after he decided to lead an open gay life. And and so what you're talking about, I think, speaks very much to that that moment. I mean, for him. Yeah, I don't know. Well, Ed, Edmund uh, was at Stonewall um, as a, a spectator. I came. I was at Stonewall as a spectator uh, in 1969. So uh, we have to go back to then. But um, that was pretty much when things started to, to alter. But mm -hmm. again, there was not very many people out and around. You know, and they all arrived at the stone wall in the next week <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> um, One way or the other, you know, they showed up. Uh, and uh, Eric, did you have a comment on on that moment in your novel, uh, or did Felice? Um, say I, you know, I I don't even remember it, and I'm thrilled that he said that. I'm very very uh, heartened by that. But um, are you saying that uh, when Larry was living in London, he was not openly gay? Oh, no, he was. He was. But it meant something different in, you know, in London in the 60s. He uh, led a totally gay social life. I mean, and um, it just was there, there was a question Couldn't of be as gay as it... question of openness yeah. that was I mean, it was a very different country. It was a very different time. I mean, but uh, that was his commitment to himself. But he he had. Uh, been getting uh, 
it uh, wasn't that open in London. It really wasn't. Fair amount of action. Even when you no, even when you were with other gay men, um, and the Englishmen who came to the United States in the seventies and it is like Alan Bates was definitely in the closet in this country. Um, you know, and you know, they had their they had made all their um connections and they held on to them no matter what. You know. So um moving a little bit ahead in time, but really only about a year and a half from uh from that uh description of the dinner uh with Edmund and and Eric and Chris Cox. Um, I want to bring up, obviously, the thing that changed uh, in all, all of our lives and in the gay community and in the whole world. And uh, uh, Felice, in your diary in January of 1981, uh, you write about uh, the first person you know who uh, died of AIDS, although at the moment it was not known that he died of AIDS. And it's a man named Nick Rock. And the important thing about this uh, diary entry, I think, is uh, not only is now uh, um, AIDS coming in to uh, your lives, but um, Nick Rock, when Larry Kramer comes to publish 1112 and Counting, which is uh, two years later, March of 1983, he writes the article. And at the end of the article is a list of 20 men um, whom he has known who died of AIDS in the in the two years. And Nick Rock is the first person on that list. Um, Yesterday arrived some bad news. This is your diary. A friend, Nick Rock, died. He'd been ill for the past few months with what was finally diagnosed as catch scratch fever. Can you believe that? What? Catch scratch fever. That's what it was uh, initially uh, diagnosed as, or what his death was caused by, they said. Hypoglycemic for years, his immunological system couldn't cope with it. Before the illness could be diagnosed, he wasted away, um, uh, formed lesions on the brain, et cetera, fell into a coma, et cetera. He'd just come out of it in the past week. He and Eno Porsche, his lover of seven years, were a standard of the pines at Fire Island in the 70s. One of the golden couples, Nick was bright, sharp, sarcastic at times, always no bullshit, but soft and yielding too, curious, interested, open to new ideas. I valued him as a friend and as a good man. He will be missed by many people. And um, what's what's so devastating about that, reading that in in real time is uh, Larry Kramer uh, writes also about Nick Rock without knowing uh, what has happened. He's writing a letter in March of 1981 to a friend out of town who knew Nick. And he says, um, Paul Popham, I mean, who later becomes the uh, first president of gay men's health crisis, Paul Popham looks just the same. Two of his Fire Island housemates died, one a school teacher from cancer and Nick Rock from nobody knows what a most peculiar, long, slow disintegration that no hospital could discover why about. And I remember that Mm -hmm. summer that Nick, uh, Anna Porsche and I would come out early to Fire Island to set up the houses that we were in. Um, His was on Skywalk and mine was the next one over on Tarpon. And there were very few people, but we were talking about all the people in between who had begun to get sick over the, and we looked at each other and and said, it's sexually transmitted. There's no doubt about it. And then I remember (laughs) when I was walking off and Paul was going to his house and he turned around and he said, Felice, we're all dead men. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what I thought at that moment. We're all dead men. All because it was such a connected up community. We had all had sex with each other, slept with each other, had boyfriends with each other. And I just thought this is it's going to be the end of this whole group of people. And to a large extent, it was, you know, it really was. Um, uh, Eric, do you remember the first person you knew who died of AIDS? I remember very well, Nick, uh, hearing about Nick and the cat scratch theory. Um, 
But my God, that's such a good question. The first person I knew who died of AIDS, I would have to go into my bedroom, lie down and think for an hour uh, if it would come back to me at all. Well, um, I want to uh, stop with one more thing, uh, a picture, um, and to end on a somewhat uh, happier uh, note, although obviously there's a great deal of sadness um, uh, in, in not only the history of AIDS, but still uh, the legacy of it. But what I wanted to show is in 1982, um, uh, a group of you, uh, Larry, Kramer, uh, Felice, uh, you, Eric, all marched in the Gay Pride Parade in March in 1982 as a group of writers. And this is Larry carrying uh, a poster of Marcel Proust. The plan, um, as Jim Saslow, a friend of yours, also organized, each writer uh, who joined would march with uh, a picture of, of a dead writer. And um, this the only picture I could find of the of the March itself was Larry smiling with Marcel Proust. But um, what I wanted to read was that uh, his his live his uh, account in a letter. The gay parade with all authors carrying posters was a big success. We had about fifty: Saslow, Ed White, Felice, Eric, Farrow, Grumley, Brett Averill, Dennis Altman, and I can't remember who else. Richard Sennett, always a good representation. We were all amazed and very touched by how much applause we constantly received going up the avenue. When we got to the New York Public Library, Jim suddenly decided we should all run up the stairs. He had made a huge dinner that said gay writers. And of course, we all had our big blow up posters. When we got there and turned to look down at the parade itself, there was a huge mob filling Fifth Avenue, looking at us looking up at us and cheering, roaring wildly. It was truly a moment to remember. We all got choked up. Sure, sure. yeah, wonderful. That, that's just the most wonderful photograph. And hearing you talk about it, I, sound, I thought to myself, this is so the way we were. <laughs> Larry and Arnie, uh, Larry, Larry Mash just meant, spoke up, and he and Arnie Kantrowitz were there, of course, too. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Felice. Thank you, Bill.